What's up, Brainiacs? It's me, Dwight, here with you again. We have a wonderful show today with Tony Peterson, who is a certified music thanatologist, meaning that he uses music, particularly harp music, to help to uh, with the process of dying for those that are going through that process. So, wonderful show today. A couple things coming up on the Patreon for those of you that are kind enough to uh, donate a bit here and there to help us keep the lights on and, and move forward. If you'd like to be part of that, you can join at uh, patreon.com slash broken brain. We've got a new episode of the the Broken Chat show with Chris Revel and I talking about career transitions and, and setting goals for one's self. And also uh, some information coming up about the psychological impact of K-pop. I think I've mentioned that on here before. And uh, along with uh, video examples of each episode, including this one. So when uh, Tony is kind enough to play the harp on today's episode, you can see that video over there on uh, the Patreon if you are a subscriber. So join there to learn more. The Broken Brain. I feel like a voice, but <laughs> Tony, I'm, ex- I'm really excited to talk to you and to be able to showcase thanatology today. I've been off and on. I don't want to. I don't want to make it sound like I've been combing the earth, but I have been sending emails periodically over the last few years, looking for someone in thanatology, and I was even more excited to see with your specialty. So my my guest today on the Broken Brain is Tony Peterson who's a certified music thanatologist, and uh, we're, we're going to talk about the use of music and the study of thanatology and uh, all the things that have to do with the grief and end of life, and you're going to tell us more about that. But this is just a, I don't know, a banner day for me. It really is. I'm excited to, to hear uh, someone talk about this topic, and especially with the musical element is really exciting. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Oh no! Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's been a love and passion and lifelong journey of mine for you know twenty some twenty seven years. Well, I, why don't you start out by telling people a little bit about you? How did you get into this? And also, uh, I you know I don't know how many people out there are familiar with the concept of thanatology. Anyway, it's not a word that gets kicked around. I've, I'm always surprised, even in treatment circles, I don't hear people say thanatology very often. Right. I mean, it's a good place to start is just with that basic notion of, so Thanatos was a Greek personification of death. So Thanatology is all about the study of death and dying. A lot of times that takes on sort of an anthropological look at, you know, funeral and burial practices, grief and mourning. But um, in the context of a music Thanatologist with a little hyphen in between, my role is a lot more about um, the the process of dying that people go through. So I uh, work at a, in a hospice and I bring music to the bedside as people are going through these um, kind of end of life stages, using music as a clinical tool to help address some of the mostly symptom management issues they're having in terms of pain, restlessness, trouble breathing um, at the physical level, but then also music has this way of it touching us, you know, emotionally and spiritually. And so different people, different circumstances sort of call for different things. And that's where a trained clinician steps in to use music in this uh, specific way, kind of tailored to each person based on what's going on in that moment as they're dying. And that's the thing I think is very fascinating about it is that it is focused on those that are going through death primarily and i is there is there a branch or approach of thanatology music thanatology that that uh, involves or works with those that are loved ones or family members cuz my impression has been that it's almost always focused on those that are going through the end of life those that are dying right i mean the primary focus is the is the person who is on their deathbed generally mm-hmm. um but in hospice we recognize that people are not dying alone. You know, like it used to be back in the old days, 
they would talk about the lung cancer in room 12. Like there wasn't even a person in room 12. It's like the hospital oh, mentality wow. was sort of harsh like that. And, and in hospice, we understand that it's a person in room 12 and that person comes from a social context. So a lot of the work that the hospice team is doing is addressing what's going on with the family and with the other caregivers and just the the social system is a is the the unit of care is not the disease it's not even the person it is that social system so while my focus is what's going on with the patient in terms of their breath and their pulse and their pain level of pain i'm also cognizant of what's going on in the room you know what's going on with those family members sometimes the music has to address that the emotional distress that's going on or Sometimes it's a reflection of the, you know, spiritual context for a certain person or a certain family. So all those things kind of play into it. Although I want to say like 80% of my attention is really on the physical situation of the patient. Mm -hmm. It's similar to the uh, with psychological therapy. There's uh, the trainings for diagnosis, for example, our emphasis uh, is around uh, how do you, there's a whole section and even in the diagnostic manual that talks about, do you address someone as depressed or someone with depression? Is some, do you say, mm. oh, so-and-so is bipolar or so-and-so has bipolar disorder? You know, the, those distinctions are important and so interesting to humanize. And so the music then is a very humanizing process, right? Where you are actually having a person get in touch with themselves emotionally, psychologically. What's the process? And the well, I mean, I think those it? things, yeah, I think that's a good question. I think it's those are like automatic byproducts um, of this approach. I mean, so if we talk about really specifically, I'm literally bringing a harp into hospitals, nursing homes, and bringing a harp to the bedside to to bring music into that setting. And I mean, sometimes, like uh, last week, we had a person coming off of, uh, you know, they were intubated getting the vent removal. So, I mean, the family has this notion of like, oh, we're pulling the plug and it's this harsh time and decision. But then we bring music into that context where it's full of machines and, you know, beeps and buzzes and alarms going off and, you know, all kinds of um, medical staff present, you know, respiratory therapists and doctors, nurse, social worker, chaplain, like whole, like full court press, you know, cause this is right. a big deal in terms of what everybody's having to grapple with and deal with um, physically and emotionally and spiritually and socially. And so bringing music into that setting, yes, I'm there to address what's going on with that patient, but it also, like you said, is kind of humanizes the whole situation because that room is really sterile ultimately in the intensive care unit. I mean, for, for really good reason. And the harp is this nice piece of wood and it's this live ringing strings that ha that it changes the whole circumstance for people. And maybe it doesn't fix everything. You know, it's not going to fix the ultimate problem of why this person is coming off of life support, but it, it helps that it helps that person, you know, when they're going from all the bells and whistles of modern medicine to basically nothing trying to breathe on their own and maybe they can and maybe they can't music in that context so one of in that specific circumstance you know i'll i'll start playing bef while they're still on the ventilator and i'm connecting the pacing of the music with that pacing of the machine that's you know directing oh, wow. their breathing so there's a lot of interaction you'd mentioned before that you're conscious of things like they're where they're at on the monitors and some of the well, yeah. sound of the room then so, the, well, really specifically, I mean, the main idea with music thanatology is to connect what I'm doing musically with what's going on physically for this person. So the pace of their breathing is the, is the easiest and first way to kind of connect what I'm doing with what's going on for them. I literally accompany them. So they're setting a pace, but they also have like a, a amount of work that they're doing and they have a, how deep are their respirations all those have kind of musical correlates so i'm basically reflecting back what's happening so in that intensive care unit circumstance the machine is determining how fast they're going how deep their breaths are they're not really doing any work in that circumstance because the machine's doing any doing the work so i start the music and and connect with that what the machine is doing 
And so then when they remove the machine, I'm still connected with what their pattern, you know, if they can establish their own respiratory rate and rhythm, Mm. that's where I'm, I'm now reflecting that. And so I connected the music with their breath when they're on the machine. And then I stay connected once they're off the machine. Mm. And sometimes people, you know, have that um, process where like we see in the movies, you know, where they, they come off the machine and then, you know, they sort of peacefully transition out of this world. That happens like 10% of the time. I say a lot of times it's not right. People, it, it, anyone who's been there for a loved one passing away knows that that's not how it always happens. Right. Yeah. So there's a, I mean, so there's this period of what's going to happen and waiting to see, and they're trying to kind of find their way through this process that there's not really a, there's not instructions for them. There's no map that they can follow. So they are sort of questing about and music has this way of kind of walking alongside them. Um, you know, like sort of metaphorically holding their hand in a, in a way, just like, a, a con- I think a lot of accompaniment. I, I like how you use that word a minute ago, accompanying them, right? Yeah. Um, I'd never, I was not aware of that. That's, that's fascinating to me. Do you, how tightly do you track that? So if they're coming off, uh, or and I guess it's not always a ventilator situation. If they are having irregular or labored type of breathing, how do you work with that with the music? Well, in that fact, that's um, most of what I do is is connecting what I'm doing with what's going on physically. Like I said, so as people approach the end of life, whether it's coming off of a vent or just more of a kind of a natural decline that people are going through, like whatever course they're taking, that's what I'm following. And so musically, you know, most of the music that we hear and, or, you know, that's that we're streaming or wherever you are, it's, it's regular meat. It has a regular meter to it. It's got a beat and a, and a flow and you can kind of dance to it. But a lot of times as people are approaching end of life, those regular rhythms in the body are losing their coherence and so I can play music that is a regular beat to it as if that's what they're doing. But a lot of times there's these breaks and pauses or speeding up and slowing down. And, and musically I can, cause I, that's my training is to sit and watch that and, and reflect it back. I can move along with them. And I think sometimes about, it's almost like when you're helping a little old lady across the street, like if she's really rickety, sometimes the like the best and easiest and quickest way would be to pick her up and carry her across the street and then put her down. But that you that's not what you do. That's not what you, right. That's not the assignment. That is no, that doesn't work. But what you do is you kind of put your hand behind her back and you have your other hand there if she wants to, if she needs to grab onto something. And if she teeters a little bit, you have that hand behind her back and you go, Oh, I gotcha. I'm right here with you. And I think that's a little bit what happens musically with music thanatology and a person that's dying. It's just moving alongside them and that kind of assurance that there's someone here with you. And for somebody who is, you know, sometimes people are cognitively compromised or it's not clear what their level of cognition is. But when we connect with breath and pulse, you know, tension, temperature, these physical manifestations, it sort of doesn't matter yeah. what what their understanding is because that those things, just like a, a holding someone's hand, it's reassuring without needing to understand it. Mm-hmm. You know, so so musically I use the harp because it has a lot of, I mean we can get into that, why it's a harp, but it's got a lot of versatility. But yeah. one of the other the other aspect of music that uh music thanatologist spring is, is vocal, like uh, singing, you know? So the voice has a really particular texture and effect. I mean, it, when you sing, someone knows, even like a person with advanced dementia n- knows what that sound means, mm-hmm. whether, you know, at, at a sort of a corporeal level, at a physical level, we're familiar with that. And in, in that circumstance, perhaps the harp is a little too um, ethereal or there's no context for it sometimes, but someone singing 
simple phrases that are repeating kind of short repeating phrases that become familiar, that dementia patient will find assurance in that because we know the sound of a voice. Yeah. And so it really is an assurance type of, it's not just playing a song in a room for everyone to be chill. Which I would imagine is probably what people think the first time they hear about this, right? They think, that is, oh, you're yeah, playing you, classical music, or you're, but you're not talking about even necessarily playing songs. You're exactly right. And that is exactly what people think. And it's sort of this constant job that I have of helping people contextualize what it is that we're doing. And, and while there's, I mean, there's plenty of room for that. People, I mean, it's great to play music in different contexts. Um, this is not about just playing a nice song. I mean, it's really about connecting this music and the body and addressing these physical, sometimes problems, but sometimes just the situation that a person's in physically. And that, I mean, I see it time and again, how, you know, if I'm, if that person has a elevated respiratory rate and their shoulders are kind of hunched up by their ears and they're very tense and you start pacing music along with their breathing and the breaths get a little deeper and the shoulders come down and you know like the circumstances change and then the music changes there's this dance that evolves where they you know i'll start with what i see and then they'll shift a little bit and then that's now we're going that way and it's, mm-hmm. we, we just, that's how it unfolds from there. So there's no, yeah, there's not a, there's not specific songs that I'm playing. I, I assiduously avoid requests and we talk about it beforehand, how it's, how it's not a concert of familiar yeah. favorites. It's more about this relaxing kind of meditative time for people. Wow. So I, Education would be have to be part of that too, because people would assume, yeah, you know, oh, oh yeah, my gosh, can you yeah. play the Ode de Floor or whatever? Um, oh yeah, yeah, then, they're either asking for Amazing Grace or Stairway to Heaven and oh, okay. or Freebird or Freebird, you know, like just, uh, like because they're being funny. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> that works. But it's fascinating that it reminds me a little bit of a technique that I've come across when I used to work in. A, it was like a youth corrections setting, and we'd very, very. Um, volatile young people that were there. And ours was a mental health facility, not a corrections facility. So a lot of these kids would come from places in their own life or even in their own institutional experience where they were, okay, I'm tough and people are going to be tough back to me. And we're, so we would try to actually match, they call it matching and mirroring. Right. And sure. and where to where you might have a kid who's like, ah, I'm super pissed off and I'm yelling at everybody. And you'd maybe would start out naturally. We match the kid. Right. Just people are that which is a, a problem. Caregivers and authorities, <laughs> you know, say, stop it. You knock it off. And now we're just yelling at each other. So we might start out by saying something like, hey, I can tell you're really mad. But and then we'd start to. And it, and it was amazing. Even in one sentence, you could kind of lower your own voice, and they would go like, "Yeah, well, I'm just going to be pissed off that the teacher took my points." Well, now what are we? Well, doing? what now we're talking right. to each other, right? <laughs> exactly. It's like, it, and it would be completely wrong if they're like, oh, "I'm all pissed off," and you're going, "It's okay, just be <laughs> yeah. quiet." Like, how Which angry? Is the other are instinct. You? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so so exactly, we want to meet people where they're at. Now, probably the difference between what you were doing and and what I might do musically is that I'm not going to direct, I'm not going to choose a direction that we're going to go. So sometimes people are breathing, you know, like I saw a guy maybe a couple of weeks ago now with emphysema. So his lungs don't expand all the way. So there's a lot of tightness and his, his respiratory rate was like 50, more than 50 a minute, which is really quick. And uh, we had a, there was a new nurse that we had and she was like, can you go in and slow it, slow him down? Well, that's not, that's not the idea because like my premise is that he's doing the best he can. Right. And so if I come in, think I know what's better, I'm just asking for trouble. And so I just meet him where he's at. Now that doesn't mean that I'm going to play as fast as he's breathing, what I'm going to do is like, if he's breathing at 50 breaths a minute, you know, maybe I'll play at 25 a minute. I can go half the speed and yet, and then, but we're still in sync. And so then what will often happen? I was, so here's, I'm going to breathe a little bit into the microphone 
when you're breathing at 50 breaths a minute, it's something like this. <sighs> Pretty quick. So I can play at half that speed. And what happened was he goes, <sighs> so there was this one little moment of a one deeper, slower breath. And so musically, I can pace along with what he's doing. He's in a very regular rate and rhythm. Mm -hmm. So I can play regular, but then I can put these little moments of spaciousness here. I happen to have a harp. I happen to have a harp sitting here. So it's like this a little bit. So I can be playing along and go. I can have that moment of space. Then we can go back in. So that's about that's what we're talking about in terms of tailoring the music based on what's going on for that patient. And it changes it changes moment by moment. And it's largely you so it's not directive in the sense that you're taking your cues from the patient. It do you see interactions the other way though? As you're describing, it sounds like there is an effect sometimes of the music. Or is, a, is this a chicken egg scenario? <laughs> right. Um, there. I mean, if there wasn't an effect, there would be no point, right? Yeah, so, right. so there is an effect. But I guess my point is that I'm not trying to decide the direction that we're taking. Right. So if if it didn't happen in that case, but in there have been other cases where because I think with the emphysema, he couldn't breathe deeper and slower, but in other circumstances, similar things have happened. And then they'll, and somebody will shift into a, a different breath pattern that is deeper, more relaxed. And in fact, I mean, that's a lot of what I see is that easing up of the work that's happening. And it's like, if, if what I'm doing is reflecting back what's happening, it's like when it's like holding up a little bit of a mirror, and it gives people feedback about, oh, this is what this is where I'm at. This is what's happening. And then if I try this other thing, oh, well, now I'm getting that reflected back. And if they find a path that feels better or seems better or whatever, for, I don't know what is happening internally for them. I can just look at these physical cues, like I was talking about, that the release of tension or the deeper, easier breaths or... I mean, people falling asleep, like most musicians, like if the, if the people you're playing for, if they all start snoring, it's bad, you know, you've, you've messed up. But for me, if I leave the room and everybody is, I'm like, oh yeah, that's the best kind of applause. That's, I mean, that's almost as good as it gets. Yeah. I, I, when you mention that, I wonder if some of the, the assumptions people have, you mentioned even a nurse maybe had that, that request or that feeling um, and family might have that too. The expectation of directiveness somewhat. Mm. Is that, does that tie in with our, our difficulty and acceptance of the end of life process? I mean, cause there's Ooh. a big piece of saying, I'm not trying to change what's going to happen, but sometimes we assume, no, no, we're trying to change what's going to happen. I mean, that's a, I, that's, I'm not sure about that. I mean, there's certainly that, although most of the people that I see, I mean, so for context, you know, there's music thanatologists around the world and we have different kind of practices based on the, the, the roles that we've stepped into. I tend to see people in the last days and sometimes hours of their life, sometimes last minutes of their life. So, so basically just because of my, um, work in the Chicago area. I work for journey care hospice. They, uh, this practice has evolved such that most of those people that I see, everybody knows where, where we're going, what's happening. I certainly have colleagues that see people kind of further back in the, in the trajectory. And so that they might have months to live. And then there's a lot more of that, I see. you know, kind of psychological coming to terms with the different stages of grief, you know, and, and for most of my people, everybody understands kind of where we're at and what's going on. 
I mean, and I say most, that is by no means all. There's always, you know, you get into these situations where there's a big family presence. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get called in to go see somebody. And a lot of times people want to gather for it. It becomes a little bit of a, there's a coming together that happens in the family. So people have been visiting, but, oh, we're going to have this thing that the harp is going to come. And like, so, you know, everybody who's been coming all shows up at the same time. And so I'll have a room full of, you know, 20 people. Well, some of them are sitting there going, it's okay, mom, let go. Like, we'll be fine. And across the bed from her is her sister saying, don't leave me, mom. You know, like yeah. there's all, there's the whole range of, you know, that kind of human experience and grief. So they were hard and to, so, yeah. Yeah. There's not one answer to what needs to happen. Is it ever difficult to keep your focus on the uh, those that are dying when there there's so much emotion in the room and so much going on sometimes? Is that oh, a challenge that you've had to to? I mean, that's uh, in mostly no. I mean, that's kind of part of the training that I went through was to really sort of how to hold focus regardless of what's going on because some of these circumstances, yeah, very tumultuous and I mean wailing grief sometimes, you know, right. and sometimes somebody's sitting in the corner, just reading a magazine, like who, you know, like whatever, are we done yet? You know, is, have they, you know, like there's some callousness there, and well, and you never know, right. The relationships and the years mm-hmm. and years that have culminated into the moment of death. And it is interesting how individually we all mourn differently and then again, there's relationship issues that come to play. If someone's like, there's, "Look, we have yes. a good enough relationship that I'm here, but we're not, we're you know, that's it's it's, it's not that and broken, good, right?" right. Uh, and we talk yeah. about you know any dysfunction that was existing in the family doesn't go away when you know things get difficult. In yeah. fact, it all gets a lot comes up comes up even more. So, yeah, that is all happening. But I think of that aspect of in terms of like where do I keep my attention, um. I think about, so I've, uh, my wife gets massages. I don't go for massages a lot. I've had, I don't know, half a dozen, maybe a dozen in my life. And my experience, limited experience with massages are there's two good, there's two kinds of massage in the one they start at your neck and then they work their way down and then they do this and they, they're going through just, here's the, the order of events that I learned in school. And then the other kind of massage is they put their hands on your back and they go, Oh, what's this? Like, mm, like right there. Yeah, and you go, uh-huh, right there. And then they go, Oh, I'm going to work on that. Mm-hmm. And, and hopefully I think my approach is more like that second one where we start, but it, what is the issue in the room comes clear very quickly. Sometimes the patient is just fine. They're peaceful. They're not in any kind of distress or difficulty, but there's a grieving family member. So then, yeah, the music mm-hmm. I can like, you know, maintain a connection with the patient, but musically, I really need to accommodate that person who is having the difficult time. It's, it, it, I mean, it gets a little more difficult in that room full of 20 people. You can't sure. tune into everybody, but you, what you naturally do or what I've naturally, or, you know, been trained to do, I guess is focus on what is the biggest issue. You got to start with the big stuff. And so if it, if it's the person who is struggling to breathe in bed, I don't really care about anybody's emotions right now. I really worry. I'm really focused on, we want to get those breaths, you know, not in such a distressful place. And that sounds a little directive on my part and it's hard to avoid that. Sure. But when you see somebody who looks like they're suffering, that's that's the impulse. And everything else goes out the window. It's a me. kind of a and triage mentality. It's though. a it's yeah. a very much a triage mentality. And then this ongoing place. And then that's what happens is you address the one thing, every that settles down, you're like, oh, and now this is the next thing. And then we shift our focus there. And sometimes that's just emotionally with the patient, with the family, you know, maybe now this person's having a little, like the tears come up and, and then those settle, but now that has started, like it's a domino effect that has got this person over here. Now their grief is coming up. And so then it moves around the room sometimes. And the interesting thing for me, because we have this context of bringing music to the bedside and these people are all tired and worried And, you know, got all kinds of things that they had, like decisions to make and people to talk to and all this stuff. And now we're having this moment of just sitting and not having to do anything. 
and taking a couple of deep breaths. And the, so the tears will come for the family and then, and then people will fall asleep. They, like mm. Sometimes it's one or the other, but a lot of times it's one and then the other. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, you're absolutely right. I know that I've seen that with family and over the years, people will sometimes even gather, and, and if, if it's a drawn out at all, and I'm talking about even days or a week or more, uh, where someone is in that position, oftentimes family will make sure they're never alone. And so you'll have two mm-hmm. to three people in the room all the time, and there becomes a, a sort of like, we sort of live in this space now for this time. People might be over in the corner playing cards, even if they, mm-hmm. you know... Because they're there for for shifts almost you know, that they take right. Well, they're holding vigil. They're holding whatever. holding yeah. vigil is this no is the, it's an ancient notion right yeah. of holding vigil, and that's what we actually call a music thanatology mm-hmm. session. It's called a music vigil. It's this time of sitting with somebody, mm-hmm. and that's and so there's not an agenda when you're holding vigil. You're just there to be there. Now with your practice. You don't tend to go to the same room or the same patient, I should say, uh, probably more than once if they're in the last hours of life. I mean, you probably see people single, single vigils mostly. Then, for my practice, yeah, it's once, you know, maybe twice on the out, maybe three times on the very outside, because sometimes that the process is attenuated, and that's mm-hmm. and and sometimes they're there for uh, in in that time for you know a week two weeks and and they could be imminently actively dying for a week or two sometimes because yeah. there's not we don't really have a handle on how it all happens and so sometimes yeah it, i might see a person on monday and i go again on thursday and they might still be around the next monday or tuesday you know sometimes that happens a lot of times you're right though once or twice mm-hmm. yeah and you mentioned it, it's the music you're playing notes to go along with what's going on. There's is there a style would you say to it or a because you're not playing songs like you say, but is there a um, you know the approach of what you play? Well, so oh, that means good. That's probably a good transition to like in the theory behind music thanatology. Mm-hmm. There's musical correlates to various body processes. And, and at a really basic level, you know, we have heart rhythms and we have breath rhythms. And so in terms of the pace of music, a lot of times it's really easy to connect the pace of what I'm playing to the pace of the breathing peripherally to the pulse. I'm not sitting there checking somebody's pulse kind of continuously, but I will check their pulse when I first come into the room mm. just to see what that there's an, there's a lot of interesting information about the ratio between someone's breath and their pulse. Typically we have about four heartbeats per breath. And so when I count how fast they're breathing, and then I feel how fast their pulse is going, it tells me a lot about how those systems are working together or whether they're sort of decoupling. And it tells me how the body is doing, how much work it's doing to try and maintain, you know, homeostasis or whether it's kind of giving up on that. And these systems will start to widely why get wildly erratic in terms of their proportionality to each other. So that tells me something about what's going on at this rhythmic kind of pacing side of things. But then in terms of um, the musical kind of building blocks that I might bring to the bedside in terms of what I'm playing, melody is this other super important building block um, that really relates to kind of cognitive processes. So if I have a melodic line that's moving along, it's very much like the flow of our thoughts. So here, I'm going to go back to the little harp again. So here's the little harp. And if I focus on melody, if I just think about, just experience this for a little bit. So not a lot of, there was no meter there, You couldn't find a beat or a pulse that was just melody. And it takes us on this little journey 
And the journey that you go on is different than the person, the, the journey that I went on. It's a little bit like when we go watch a movie, I think. We all see the same movie. We all see a different movie, right? Mm-hmm. And so the so melody is like that. It makes sense to have a more well-developed melody when you have a person who is kind of cognitively intact and present. Mm-hmm. You know, some I mean, rarely for me, some of my colleagues more so, have a patient who's sitting up, eyes open, talkative, you know? And so you need to have that melodic level of engagement. On the other end of that spectrum is, uh, you know, a stroke patient or dementia patient who either has very limited cognitive capacity or it's just unclear what their level of cognition is. So there, I don't want to pile on a bunch of melodic interest because I'm sort of asking too much. I don't want to be putting anything on anybody. That dementia patient is going to benefit more from something that's more like this. So the so there's a lot of regularity to that regularity in terms of pacing i'm only using two mostly two chords i slipped a third one in there but mm-hmm. even if i just keep it with two chords like if i just did two chords here like you and all of our listeners would like get a little bored because we're like okay yeah you played that note already um because we're looking for more melodic engagement like the melody is more where we're at right now. Yeah. Um, but that dementia patient will find kind of this, you know, physical reassurance in things that are quickly familiar. So repeating and short cycling phrases makes a lot more sense. So all these kind of factors in terms of rhythm and melody, another basic building block is harmony. You know, harmony is all about the relationship between two things. Here's two notes at a time. And now they're moving together. Or I can take them closer together. Or I can have them moving apart. And then back together. So, mm. so what the harmony is doing is really about the relationships that we see in the room. Sometimes there's like a like a child, like you know, like an adult child spooning their mother in bed. Like that's a mm-hmm. picture of really close harmony. That's like Simon and Garfunkel harmonies, you know, mm-hmm. like really nice and close. On the other end of that spectrum. I might see somebody in a nursing home who's a ward of the state and they don't ever have visitors. So that doesn't mean they don't get harmony. In fact, they might need harmony because they don't have somebody spooning them in bed. So we can reflect what's there, but we can also provide what's missing. So I kind of have to put all those factors together. What's the, what's the pulse and you know, what's the pacing and what's the rhythm? What's their cognitive capacity? What's the social situation? And then you know, and that's, that's just like my basic three to start with that determines what it is. What does it sound like? What is that, What am I going to play? Actually, mm-hmm. it's kind of this combination of those factors and then probably 15 or 20 other ones that, I mean, how There's long is a, our podcast? Well, yeah. <laughs> hey, we'll go. We'll, we'll, we got time. I, I, uh, the, the thing that strikes me about that is that there is a lot going on. And I think that oftentimes uh, with people when they come across things and counseling sometimes is looked at this way and other things where people say, Oh yes, you're just, you, if you got a knack for talking to people and it's like, well, there's a lot going on in the room when you're trying to talk to people in a healing way. And with doctors as well, it's like, well, I guess you got to know when, when to give them what medicine. Okay. Well, hopefully there's a lot more going on in that room. And you're describing a very clinical 
practice, right? And a set of skills and abilities, and also even just the ability to uh, integrate all the information that you're picking up and being cognizant of, and then at the same time playing the harp. Uh, right. You know, that's got to that's got to take a a lot of work that you're doing in the room during that vigil. Yeah, I mean, but I've been also doing it for whatever twenty six or seven years, mm-hmm. so there was a time when that was extremely daunting, you know, but, and, but the training I went through was extremely thorough. And so I felt like I knew what to do. It gave me the tools that I needed. And, and so part of those are musical tools. Part of those are kind of this anatomy and physiology. Like this training was a little bit like um, maybe first year medical school. Cause I need to know what's going on with the body and I need to understand Beyond that, I need to understand what is happening in the end of life process, like the thanatological side of that. You know, what happens, you know, as somebody dies of heart disease versus as somebody dies with dementia versus, you know, so we would go through all the different major disease categories and sort of trace the typical path that people go through. You know, renal disease has its own kind of profile. And so, I need to understand what the body is up to, what it's capable of. And then I also have to be able to be present to the family, to the grief that's going on or whatever is going on. Sometimes they're telling jokes, you know, it's, it's the whole range of that. And I can't be like, oh, super somber and solemn if they're, you know, cracking jokes and telling stories. Yeah. You have to, and it all of that also in. wraps up with it. So in a way it's the personalities in the room and the personality of the, uh, the one who is passing on is also there, right? Even if they're not conscious, because I, I remember, I've seen that where if the person is a more jovial person, everyone's going to be more that way. Cause they know that's how they want them to be. And they oh, probably exactly. have that kind of family system anyway. Well, and that's so, yeah. one of the things that's really reassuring for the family is to know that they themselves are carrying on in that vein, in the legacy that's appropriate to them. And sometimes it's super prayerful. You know, sometimes that's what a, a person and their family system has, you know, developed as their approach. Yeah. Those, I mean, those can be incredibly powerful places to be too. And they're just as amazing as the ones where they're cracking really inappropriate jokes. Like <laughs> it's, it's really great to have that whole gamut. And then the other part of my training, I have to walk out of that scenario and then walk into the next one, two rooms down yes, and yeah. it's the other end of the world. And I have to not bring any of the previous one, but be present to the new one. And that's, there's a really good kind of internal process they have to be present in a very specific way to Mm -hmm. do this yeah no i imagine that as you put it it comes with time also but there's got to be some just uh training but also just personality you know as you were playing uh the experience that i was having as i was listening to it and trying to put myself in the shoes of someone who might be a patient uh, the thing was that it was not only relaxing, which is probably the very first thing, once again, people go to when they think of music for someone who's dying. Oh, it's relaxing. It's probably nice. Great. It was that. But at the same time, it was also engaging in a real, like like there was an engagement. It was different than really cognitively engaging and that it wasn't taxing in that way, but that it pulled me in to where I was having part of this process. There was... Uh, and, and so I can see that where you're reaching past someone who is, is maybe at a point where they're beyond language. They're not going to sit and have a cognitive verbal discussion about things. Um, but I could feel that real pull into where I was being engaged in what was happening. Um, so, I mean, that's interesting to hear. I'm curious if you're talking about the melody example or just the, you know, the simple dementia example. But um, But I think another thing that happens is I'll see people that are in pain, for example, like, so the, the hospice staff, they have certain people that they really like me to go and see and people that are in pain or people who are having respiratory difficulties, difficulties, they really top the list. And so for that person who's in pain, it's, it's, and for the person with respiratory difficulties, we really don't want to exacerbate what's going on at like just at the most fundamental level, do no harm, right? We do not want to make anything worse. So, but what can happen is 
that little bit of engagement, it gives a little bit of a, I don't want to call it a lifeline because in hospice, that's not really what we're doing, but Mm -hmm. sometimes pain is your whole world. And sometimes music can crack a window open a little bit to the, to a bigger world. And that I think maybe is that engagement that you're feeling it where it's not, mm-hmm. Oh, I'm really, you know, swept into this and paying a lot of cognitive attention, but it broadens the tapestry maybe. Yeah. I, well, it's, as you were saying that, you know, the interesting thing is I'm categorizing that in my head is the, it's almost like, as you said, lifeline, the word that came to my mind was hope. And then I thought, how much do we interpret that to say, well, hope is gone now because I'm dying? Well, no, actually, hope can be experienced for any amount of time if I'm only going to live for another hour, but I feel some kind of akin to that feeling. Is it hope that I'll survive? Or is it just a feeling of general in the moment hope that my pain isn't my main thing right now? Or is some other other aspect of that to where... To me, that was the word that kept coming to my mind, even though we're talking about an impending death. Right. Like to me, this is all sort of a fascinating, like I spend a lot of my time thinking about these things and I always have to revert back to, but what am I seeing? You know, what's going on with the breath? Because I can imagine all kinds of stuff, but but I really need to um, always pull it back to, are those breaths deeper? Are they easier? Are they slower? Is that where's the tension? Like that's kind of my lifeline where I can, because I can have all my own interpretations, but those things are pretty infallible. Like you can't hide if you're in pain. You can't hide if you're having trouble breathing. And so when those things get better, that's also clear too. And that's Mm -hmm. that's what keeps me kind of focused and moving in, I hope, the right direction. Do people mostly embrace this service? You know, they there's, just, I could imagine, I would think most people would be pretty happy to see you. There's, I mean, people are usually not unhappy when you walk into the room with a harp. I mean, versus like the nurse coming in with a needle, you know, I'm, right. I'm a lot more welcome sometimes, but I mean, it's, it's not for everybody, but I get, it's one of those things, you know, 30% of the people, it's the best thing that they've ever heard of. And, you know, 50% of the people it's like, yeah, that's nice. You know, there's their initial thought. Okay, give it a try. And then afterwards, I think a lot of them have a different yeah. impression and are, are a lot more in favor of it. And then there's 20% that are like, eh, that's not, that's not our, we're going to play some, you know, Motorhead or whatever, stairway you know, like heaven, right. play some Stairway to Heaven, which is great. Like, I love that people can kind of make those determinations. And sometimes, this offer, some of the nurse will say, oh, well, you want to try this? This is really great, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, mm, no, but it gives them ideas. Like, oh, but maybe we'll do this. And they do their own thing. Yeah. Great. Do what fits. Do what, do what you know, because you know them better than any it's, of us do. It's fascinating, too, with the, the reciprocity and the relational nature of what you're doing. Uh, because you couldn't just get, you couldn't say, oh, here's a... Uh, well, somebody must have thought of it uh, for for marketing purposes, but I, you know, it wouldn't be the same to say, well, here's a here's an album of uh, thanatological music, you know, therapy types of melodies that you can listen to. Someone might, I mean, now that I said that, I put that out in the world. Maybe somebody's going to try to do it, but but it wouldn't be the same thing. That would be like saying, let me listen trademark to the, a trademark the broken brand. Trademark exactly. We'll talk about that off air. Hold on, let me just mark where <laughs> I'm going to edit this out. All right. Patent pending, everybody out there. So, if uh, but but it wouldn't have that. It wouldn't have the relationship piece any more than listening to an audio book, a self help audio book. You wouldn't say I did a session of therapy, right? Exactly. Um, right. It's not that it would be detrimental. It could still be good for you. Sure. But it's it's not therapy, right? Yeah. But you talk about yeah that close monitoring and how you are actively part of it, reactive to them. You know, and and accompanying is such a such a huge part of it that I hadn't thought of. Um why a harp? Do you want to talk a little bit about the choice of oh, that? Yeah. Is that kind of yeah, a yeah. big part in most thanatologists or do people well, all, go with different yeah, things? All music thanatologists are trained in the use of harp and voice okay. at the bedside. The harp is really specifically uh, a practical choice. It's not so much for the kind of symbolic 
presence, although it brings His that. Angels and that, play it. I thought that was oh, what I was expecting. <laughs> oh, that is like the sharpest double edged. <laughs> that is the sharpest double edged sword in my existence. Um, but the reason angels play it, I've decided, is because the 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 tone is so pure. Mm. Like. Like I love a saxophone, for example, like a well-played saxophone. I love the end of Saturday Night Live because that guy can just wail on the sax. But what you hear when you hear a saxophone is the saxophone. It's got this character, you know, musical um, timbre. And so the harp doesn't have that. It's a pure tone. So if I play these two notes on a harp, if I just play one note, if you were to map that on an oscilloscope, you get almost a pure sine wave. It's just clean. Whereas the saxophone looks like a Richter scale during an earthquake. It's mm-hmm. overtones and all kinds of extra color. Harp is really pure. So if I want to bring kind of basic musical building blocks to the bedside, because I don't know what a patient needs, I want to have as many options available as I can. So I want to start with kind of the fundamentals. So this pure tone is is a little bit essential. Then the harp also has the ability to play multiple notes at one time. Where the saxophone, again, love the saxophone, you only get one note at a time. So basically you can only play melody on a saxophone. Okay. And that's true of most instruments other than like piano, but I don't want to haul a piano around. You don't want to, you know, electronic keyboard. consideration too, right? You got to get stuff around. Yeah, exactly. So you could bring an electric keyboard, but then you're bringing more electronics into a sterile environment full of machines. Mm-hmm. So the harp does have this other presence. Sometimes I'll bring the harp in and set it down and the family will go, ah, oh, just seeing it. Like it's this wooden sculpture, basically, that we don't see a lot of. It's not something that we have a lot of experience with, which gets me to this other aspect that I think I want to touch on, which is this. We have our set of expectations. People have these scripts that they follow in life. So when you're at work, you are you got your worker bee script that you're working through. And then when you're at home, you're you have your home role. But when people are dying and then when people are around somebody that's dying, there's not any good scripts. And so people are feeling a little bit lost or they're going off of the scripts that they've seen from movies and TV, which, as we've said, are basically terrible in terms of what to expect and how to be. Um, Because in the movie, it happens over the course of an hour. And then in person, it happens over the course of two weeks and you can't equate the two there's and everybody uh gets uh, you get more beautiful in a medical uh death on movies right it's like everything is beautiful and touching and we have this it's always perfect yeah Yeah. there's none of the troubles that can sometimes arise so so people are sort of questing about for how to be and you bring in this harp to this setting and then everybody goes oh I do not, I know how to be at a concert. So maybe it's going to be that. And so they'll start with this notion of like, it's like a concert. And then we disavow them of that notion. We talk about, it's just sort of quiet and meditative and not a concert of familiar favorite songs. So then what happens is they end up just being present and they don't worry about the script and they're just in the room and whatever they need to do they now kind of have permission to do because there's not something they're supposed to do, which to me is kind of the best thing about this for the family. I think that kind of permission to be however you need to be. And the harp will do that. It, it opens the door. It kind of carves out this protected space. And I think a lot about there's like, we have ritual processes that we go through. And our society has gotten away from a lot of them. We still have like weddings and funerals, but we've lost a lot of our rituals that kind of governed in older societies. What you do now, what do we do in this circumstance? We've lost that around death and dying. You used to gather, used to, it would happen in someone's home. You'd be bringing food. You'd sit with the dying person, you know, like, because they're your neighbor and you've known them forever. And you would have seen a lot of death. And now people haven't. And that 
they, so they don't know what to do and they're a little bit freaked out and bring this music in and and they can kind of reacclimate to what this is like what this experience is and sometimes like we've said before that the emotions will come up and for some people that's not comfortable they want to like I'll walk into these rooms and the family is gathered, but they're having like a family reunion. So they're chitting and chatting and, you know, and like yeah. sort of ignoring what's happening. Sometimes I can really bring a room down, you know, I say, Oh my gosh, now this is serious. This is really happening. Yeah. Like we, you know, we, even the dude with the harp came in like that's, <laughs> and, but then they're present and then that emotion yeah. might come up and then I might leave and they can kind of blame that emotional release they had on the music, you know? Like it gives, it gives them a reason to it's it's almost like a permission to be where we're at, as you put it, or to yeah. even just to be authentically us for a minute, authentically human, you could say, uh, to, to, to really sit and say, I'm really going to feel this. And yeah. I, don't, I might not give myself permission. And for some people, maybe I never give myself permission. But yet, while I'm sitting yeah. there and this is going on, I might I might just get swept into it and give myself permission to be where I'm at right this minute. Yeah. That's t- to me. So mo- like my focus. And when I got into this, I, I had been working in this nursing home in Montana and they, these people showed up with harps and I was like, what is this all about? Mm-hmm. And I was really fascinated with this notion of music affecting the body. Like I had this patient who was curled up in a ball and just tense and distressed. And they went and played for her. And then when they left, I went and checked on her and she was just serene and all the tension had drained away. And I kind of chased him down the hallway. I was like, what did you do? And they're like, oh, we, you know, tailored this music and followed her breathing. And, and, I, and I remember saying there needs to be more of that in the world. And they're like, oh, we just graduated from this school. The only one of its kind in the world is in mm-hmm. this town you just moved to. So I was drawn by this notion of music and the body. Cause I had always thought of music as this emotional and spiritual, you know, just a cognitive psychological thing. But to see it be this physical thing, I was like, okay, that's, we need to do that. But then I came to figure out as I went through the training, it's, there's this bigger picture and, and of the family and the other emotions that are going on. At first, I, my favorite music vigils were it was just me and the patient, no family. And now, now I, I mean, it took me probably two years. I was like, Oh yes, no. We it's it's great if everybody can be there that wants to be there yeah. because sometimes they can have this kind of authentic engagement with an experience that they were lost in and now they don't feel lost afterwards. And and part of that is because I've been around dying people for two decades, I've seen a lot of the ways that people die and what happens and I'm talking to people families who have never seen somebody die. Mm-hmm. And so I can be a and me and the whole hospice team, like this, hopefully font of information about this is what I'm seeing. This is what you might expect going forward from here. That kind of assurance, because people are just, again, they don't have a map. They're not spending that. For them, it's one of the most, one of the, it's on the short list of the most significant experiences they're ever going to have in their life. And for you, it's... You know, it's significant in the sense that it is meaningful and it's your career, but it's also Thursday, right? And it's like, and, I gotta and get tomorrow, some milk. right? Exactly. Pick up milk. Yeah. I to get home and get milk and all this. And, and, and as you put it, as soon as this vigilo is over, I have to walk into the next room and be present for them. And so, but one of the things that I think you get from any kind of good clinician of any kind in any treatment circle is you, you were working with a person, a therapist, a th- music thanatologist, a doctor. You're working with someone who they have their own training and expertise, but they've also been around a lot of situations and they've seen a lot of people and met a lot of people. And if they say, hey, be ready for this, this might happen. Okay, great. That's great. I didn't know, you know, that that might happen. And if someone just took, said those five or six words, that really prepped me for something, right? Oh, yeah. You just start to give them the tools that they didn't know they needed. And that when the thing then happens they are calm. They like, Oh, this is what they talked about. Like we, we got this, that, that is super empowering. Did you have a particular relationship with music uh, before you went into training? Were you a musician um, or? Oh yeah. I mean, I'd sung in choirs forever and my mother made me take piano lessons, which I appreciate mom. Thank you for the piano lessons. I hated piano lessons. 
Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I could read and play. I had never seen a harp in person. Uh, so that was a new thing and a little bit daunting, but it's good now. Yeah. So no, I, I, I had a musical background. I had this, uh, I was working in this nursing home. So I had this kind of clinical idea about kind of what we could do in the world in the healthcare setting. So those two things really came together. Um, when I discovered this field of music thanatology. Yeah. Interesting. It's fascinating how these things come together. And you had said, I, I, that's another thing is I don't know how people go about it. You mentioned that you had just happened to move to a place where there was training <laughs> too. Cause I, you know, if I, if I was to, to scroll through a whole bunch of colleges in, in the area, how many am I going to find that have a music thanatology program? It's going to be underrepresented <laughs> from what it probably should be, I would guess. Well, yeah. So the field of music thanatology, I mean, was started in 19, what, 94. Um, the school is a tiny school. So there's graduating, you know, 20 people every two years. So it's not, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of us running around in the world. There's yeah. probably about a hundred in the world practicing. Um, wow. So really? Yeah. Oh. You know, contrasted with music therapy, there's probably a hundred music therapy training programs you know, in the world, it's a very different level of, uh, you know, impact in the world. Part of the problem is all of the music thanatologists are busy, engaged in their practices. So, you know, additional training is, uh, is a, is an issue, but I am going to put a plug in for the new school that I'm on the faculty of mm -hmm. is called Accorda Music Thanatology Institute. So it's called, it's accordaschool.org, A-C-C-O-R-D-A, Accorda School. So, uh, yeah, so we're looking at, we need more of us and people are coming to us saying, how do I do this? Yeah. And yeah, so there needs to be more training opportunities. That's the, uh, the, the other thing too, that struck me as you're saying that is I know a lot of people who do in my profession, who do like maybe let's say play therapy, DBT therapy, music therapy, there's all these different variations, art therapy. And I know a lot of people who have gone through trainings and been certified. Um, and then there's a lot of people that are just like, they have a general clinical license and then they learn how to do it and they don't necessarily get certified. With your field, with thanatology at all, as well as music thanatology, my experience has been that it isn't, maybe it's not well known enough, there aren't as many people that are just kind of half-assing it. Um, there's most people that I've run into, they're very busy, as you put it, uh, doing what they do, uh, but they're also highly like trained and certified. If they, throw, if they know enough to throw the word thanatologist uh, on there, that means they usually are one. <laughs> Does that right. make sense? I don't know. If that... <laughs> right. There's not a lot of just other people talking about it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot of the armchair <laughs> thanatologists. Because once again, I think people who care and know if they find out about it, they, they train, it seems like. It seems like quite a bit of training. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I mean, I, I want to reiterate the distinction between the thanatologists of the world and the music thanatologists yeah. of the world. They're, they're two very separate kind of entities some differences that you see there well i mean most there? most thanatologists that i hear about or have been interfaced with are on the grief and bereavement side of things mm -hmm. or death and funeral side of things so it could be counselors it could be um uh morticians are thanatologists in terms of like they will study, uh, you know, how do we care for this family as they're preparing for the interment or whatever they're, you know, process they're going to do. That's a thanatology study, okay. but there's also thanatologists that are like historical anthropologists. What did they do in, what did the ancient Maya do with their burial practices? That's thanatology also. So it's a specific branch of kind of archeology span and anthropology and music thanatology is, is, we're up before and up to, and slightly after that moment of death, mm -hmm. we don't do so much of the bereavement and, and the burial. And yeah. although I've, I mean, I've played at funerals and stuff, but it's a different segment of the timeline, really. Mm -hmm. Like we're really focused on those 
hospice patients, which is, you know, a, a expected prognosis of six months or less. And then in my personal practice, like I said, much closer to the end of life. Yeah. How, how has it affected you and your feelings about death doing this work? My feelings about death. I tend to think I'm going to live forever. Um, and this, and this has reinforced that for you somehow. <laughs> no, no. Um, I don't know if I have an answer for that. Uh, I know that we have all these notions about death and what death is like. And I don't know that I've gotten much more insight into that. I mean, it's this profound mystery is like, even I I've been in the room, something on the order of maybe 300 times when a person took their last breaths. So I've seen a lot of like the moment of death. Sure. It doesn't stop being a huge mystery. The thing that I can say is that when people are dying, sometimes there's um, sometimes it's sort of a smooth, gentle landing. And sometimes it's a rocky road that people are sort of stumbling down and, you know, collapsing at the end of. And in either case, what I've seen is that they're okay as they get to where they're going. It wasn't, it's not always easy getting there. Sometimes it's super easy. Sometimes it's like ridiculously easy. It seems like one of the first times I was present when somebody died, the impression that I had was that it was like a thread coming on like a, like a needle unthreading, like it was that easy. The needle just comes out of the thread. I mean, I've also, and since then I've seen things that I would not describe that way, but even in those difficult circumstances, they're okay. Like at, at some point they become okay. And that's reassuring, I guess, to me that, you know, that it doesn't, even if it's difficult, it doesn't get worse and worse and worse and then seem like it keeps getting worse and now you're dead. And, Mm -hmm. you know, no, there's like this, you know, the, some, some scripture I think says, describes it as the peace that passeth all understanding. And I guess I've like, I'm privileged to have seen that almost in all cases. That's a good, that's a really good insight, I think, and something good to hold on to, too, actually, um, both for oneself and for others. I think that's, that's actually a very helpful thought. That's probably one of those thoughts I know I'll find myself thinking about it. Uh, often when I talk to people on this show, I end up saying that at some point, some version of that down the road, I'll say, oh, you know, I heard uh, this, this insightful thought. That's one of those for me. So thank you for sharing that. That's very, that's very insightful, I think. Oh, no, happy, happy to get it. That's just one of, one of the things I wonder about because I have a lot of this experience. Like I, I just think of it as that's how it, the world is now. But I, I, I continually am reminded that not everybody like sees as much death as I do. Like mm. my, like my, when I, my daughters were little, they used to say, you know, how many patients did you see today? And I was like four and they're like, and how many of them died? And I'd be like, too, you know, and they didn't understand that everybody's parents in kindergarten didn't like, they thought everybody like, this is what your parents do. (laughs) They go see dying people. Well, it's interesting, as you had said too, there used to be more exposure of that just in our day-to-day culture because of the makeup of life back then. Uh, And, and now that is something that's very kept kept under wraps. We don't even like to talk about it, that it happens in front of, especially in front of children or, you know, we just don't even acknowledge it. No. And I mean, that's really advent of public health. And at the turn of the 19th century, death became medicalized, you know, it became this Mm -hmm. like a a foe to defeat, you know, so birth and death went into the hospitals and we kind of lost, like, how do you, you know, how do you give birth without a doctor there? What? How is that even possible? No. Right. It turns out that's it's... all that we could do. Well, I, I always like to ask everybody who comes on the show uh, two things. One is where people can find more about you. And uh, we're going to, you mentioned the school and we'll mention that. We'll mention that website again. The other thing I always like to give everyone a chance to do is to plug a charity or nonprofit or something that they believe in 
it doesn't have to be related to our discussion. It can be mm. certainly, but it doesn't have to be. Um, are there any charitable or community give back kind of causes that are near and dear to you that you'd like to encourage people to think about? So for me, I, and I think about this a lot, uh, like breath is this very important thing and it's, you know, you can go for two minutes without breathing two days without, or, you know, three minutes without breathing three days without water. And that's, so I try and handle that breathing side of it. And the the next one on my list is water. And so I, I am a big fan of water.org because I can't imagine not having clean drinking water. Like it's just crazy to me that there's people that have to, I'm getting a little choked up. So if I'm going to plug something, it's water.org. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, talk about a first world thing that is so easy to take for granted, you know? Oh my gosh. I mean, every morning we dirty and and dispose of a big bowl of water. I mean, not to be gross, not to be too blue out there for everyone, but think about that. You get up in the morning, go in the bathroom, and it's like how much of that water that's in there before, pre-use, would be actually such, a, would be change someone's whole day, you know, and, yeah. and their whole, like more people than you think out there in the world. That's a great plug. I'm really grateful uh, to, to get that out there. Mm. Tell Thank people, you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Tell people where they find you and uh, where they can uh, be part of your work or follow you. What would you like to share? Uh, well, I mean, so I work for Journey Care Hospice in the Chicagoland area. I'm a member and the past president of the Music Thanatology Association International, mtai.org. And then I'm on the faculty of the Accorda Music Thanatology Institute. So those are uh, places where I'm active, I guess. Is Accorda a place where people are going to, obviously they're going to be able to get training, but for anyone who might be listening out there and having the experience that you had in that nursing home years ago and saying Mm -hmm. like, holy cow, what? You know, is that a good place for them to get started? That is. And, and there's information there about kind of things to think about and, uh, we're hoping to start our first cohort in September. So that's kind of all, there's all these gears happening. Um, and it's, it's a training program that had a, an in-person kind of format, um, previously, and we're trying to move to a more, um, online option in this world, uh, to make it accessible for more people too. So, so yeah, it's certainly a place to get more information and connect. Great, and I'll put that out there. This is not an uh, this is not an official ad- endorsement. We hadn't even I didn't know about it, but now that you're putting it out there, I'm I'm. Well, how should I put it? Officially, sure, whatever. It's not a paid endorsement, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> it's just something that came up in our discussion. But I'm going to say uh, I, I'm put that out there. Everybody should uh, check that out if you have any kind of little tickle of interest as we're talking about this. It's definitely something that. It's one of those things that even as a mental health clinician for years, I didn't have any idea this existed. And when I found out about it, then I look around, like in the area where I live in practice here in Utah, I, I don't know of any hospitals that are doing this. Now, maybe I'm wrong. All those of you around me in the area, I know that there are cool things being done, and that, but I don't know of any music thanatologists in my area. I know there were some formerly. I think the one that was there moved out east. So everybody, uh, you know, should check that out if you have that interest. You, you really should. It's a it's a part of the field that I think. And I'll, I'll say this: I'm going to go ahead and say I hope that these types of things are going to become more and more the trend of the future as we understand that we actually can do. Even in situations like this where we tend to think someone's dying, we can't do anything. Well, no, we can do a lot before it happens, you know, and and to help with that process. So I'm grateful also for the work you're doing. So thank you for taking the time today to talk about it uh, because I know how busy you are actually doing it and going out there too. So uh, once again, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Troy. Thanks for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.